Hi, I'm Rachel, and at long last I am here to do my reviews for the 2012 Sammy Roar Prize. <laughs> Woo! Better late than never, right? <laughs> Earlier today, I actually finally got around to watching the live show, uh, pre-recorded, of uh, the 2018 uh, BookTube SFF Awards, which were so much fun, such a lovely uh, group of people who put that together. <laughs> Now I have to sit here alone with me, myself, and I and do the same thing with another award. <laughs> so the Sammy Roar Prize uh, each year awards an emerging Jewish author in fiction or nonfiction, with uh, even years being the nonfiction years. I always pick three of the five contenders to read, and uh, for 2012 I picked one uh, literary criticism, one biography, and one social history, and I thought that I would review them in chronological order of what uh, they cover, from earliest to latest date set. So to begin with, I have Moses Montefiore, Jewish Liberator, Imperial Hero by Abigail Green. I have my biographical notes for Green here, so I'm looking at my notes here. <laughs> Green, an indirect descendant of Montefiore's, has been a fellow of the Brasenose College in Oxford since 2000. In 2015, she was awarded the title of Professor of Modern European History by the University of Oxford. Sir Moses Montefiore was a wealthy and influential British Jew of the 19th century. He made his fortune in banking and then became a philanthropist, particularly of Jewish causes. He traveled to Palestine seven times in his lifetime, dispensing alms to the poor and founding Mishkenot Anim in 1860. It was the first Jewish settlement in centuries outside of Jerusalem's walls. Montefiore also traveled to other parts of the Ottoman Empire and Eastern Europe to assist Jews after natural disasters, during wartime, and when facing anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism. In fact, anti-Semitism, the enlightened form of Jew hatred, <laughs> was a word coined in his lifetime. He was instrumental in powering down the Damascus affair when Christians accused 13 Jews of murdering a monk. The perpetrators were arrested under medieval blood libel charges. Some of them were killed and the community as a whole was attacked. Montefiore spoke with Ottoman leaders to make them see what blood libel really was, so that no one could get arrested for it again. This book spans several decades of the Victorian era and touches on a variety of things such as imperialism versus the rise of nation states, the advent of steam technology, and proto-Zionism. This passage hews closer to Montefiore's actual aspirations for Jews in Palestine. Many European Jews were committed to occupational restructuring, and Montefiore's plans have usually been seen as part of a wider movement for Jewish productivization. Accepting strictures about the dignity of manual labor at face value, self-consciously enlightened Jewish thinkers elevated working the soil above other forms of economic activity. This was a response to the age-old complaint that Jews were economic parasites. If only Jews would abandon finance for the real work of farming or learning a trade, they could hope to become like the rest of society. In 1838, Germany's leading Jewish newspaper even published a series of articles idealizing the biblical Israelites, in which the editor Ludwig Philipson claimed that only an agrarian lot society could be fit to receive divine truths. As a successful businessman, Montefiore cannot have shared this disdain for commerce. Tellingly, he said nothing in his diary about the inherent value of working the land. Instead, by describing the project as a speculation, he indicated that his interest was purely practical. He would have no ideological objections to Arab peasants working in the fields under Jewish overseers. Instead, indeed, it was clear from the minutes of his conversation with Israel Bank that Montefiore knew perfectly well that this arrangement was what the Jews of Palestine had in mind. Given the limitations of the local economy, he simply saw agriculture as the best way for the Jewish community to generate a stable income. In keeping with Enlightenment ideas about the division of labor, he also recognized that Torah study was not for everyone, and hoped that agriculture could provide a living for those unable to do justice to a holy profession. 
Montefiore was known to be a religiously devout and stubborn man. He cut off members of his own family for joining the reformer movement. He was also quite obviously in love with his wife, Judith, though rumors persisted of his infidelity and bastard children. Green spent a little bit of time on the couple's despair on being childless. But this state and Montefiore's popularity might also have led Judith to be more active in the public sphere than most women of her time. Indeed, the Montefiore's popularity is tied in with enlightenment itself, increased technology leading the world to feel smaller, and the idea of internationalism growing. Surely, for all of the Jewish longing to return to Jerusalem, it only really felt possible mass immigration style Starting in the 19th century, Montefiore served as the linchpin, a conduit to peak Jewish interest in the years before the First Ilia. Green's writing could feel a little bit stuffy sometimes, but she covered all of this and more in a biography that saved a prominent Victorian Jew from historical obscurity. Next, I want to talk about A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction by Ruth Franklin. Franklin is a book critic and former editor of the New Republic, and of course she's written for many other publications as well. She won a National Book Critics Circle Award for her biography of Shirley Jackson, and she lives in Brooklyn, New York. In this literary criticism, Franklin documents the writings of six Holocaust survivors and a variety of people who came after, whether descendants, German citizens, or others. This book drove home for me how little uh, of old-school Holocaust canon I've actually read. So it's difficult to engage with many of her findings since I haven't read uh, a lot of the source material. Still, her blanket dismissal of much of the second generation, that is, the children of survivors, uh, gave me pause. I'm also a bit more salty about Schindler's List and the book that uh, preceded it than uh, she is. But her arguments for them are actually pretty sound. So too, I believe, is her criticism of Elie Wiesel, may his memory be a blessing, and the tight grip he kept on acceptable depictions of the Holocaust in literature. Given his quotes in this text, Wiesel wasn't a fan of any fiction entering Holocaust canon. But even when Franklin analyzes his uh, book Night, she finds a mix of facts and poetry. Many later uh, writers dabble in what she calls the nonfiction novel where a work of fiction is based off of real, often specific, events. See Schindler again. Do these works mean less because they aren't straight testimony? Or do they speak to something else? Something true, but something else. Adding a further monkey wrench to this equation, some Holocaust memoirs have since been debunked as frauds, yet our insistence on treating them um, as sacrosanct testimony means that reviewers, uh, when they first came out, fawned all over them. If they'd been reviewed more critically, maybe we, as the reading community, would have less egg on our face. <laughs> of course, there's an understandable stigma when it comes to those who fabricate false identities for themselves. But for those who present themselves as novelists and short story writers and etc., can't fiction still be meaningful? Don't these people have the right to try, maybe to succeed or maybe to fail, to imagine lives outside of their own? Franklin points to some of her favorites, including this book, which my mother gifted me over the holidays. After reading Franklin's assessment of it, I am eager to give it, give it a try. And I'll get to it eventually. So much to read. And finally, jumping to the latter half of the 20th century, we have When They Come For Us, We'll Be Gone, The Epic Struggle to Save Soviet Jewry by Gal Beckerman. Uh, Beckerman was a reporter at The Forward when this was published, and now he's an editor at the New York Times Book Review. This book is the winner of the 2012 Sammy Bohr Prize, along with many other awards and titles, and it's also my personal favorite of the three. This is perhaps a strange statement to make because it took me over a month to finish this book. I found the writing to be very crisp and to the point, but the three decades that Beckerman covered were exhaustive. He documented several activists from the USSR, America, and Israel, spanning from the 1960s to the 1980s. Particularly in the beginning of the movement, the Holocaust loomed large for Soviet and American Jews. Despite the USSR downplaying the Jewish focus of uh, 
Hitler's genocidal ambition. Some Jews started commemorating a nearby uh, Nazi massacre in Babi Yar. This led to their further identification with Judaism over the years. Even though the USSR wanted to do away with identity distinctions not sanctioned by the state, Jews did comprise a specific national identity on paper and they were subject to anti-Semitic abuse, even when highly assimilated. It should be noted that most Soviet Jews didn't want to reconnect with their roots, though Israeli visas gave them a sometimes exit from the country. Once they got to Western Europe, though, increasing numbers of them dropped out and tried for asylum in America or elsewhere. But this book focuses primarily on refuseniks, the term for the growing number of people who were refused uh, exit from the USSR, and their predecessors, Jews who felt a national, cultural, and sometimes religious connection to Judaism. On the American side, activism started small, with student grassroots organizations and corner protests but it ultimately grew very large with the designation of the Union of Councils for Soviet Jews in 1970. For American Jews, helping Soviet Jews was almost like a do-over from World War II. In the 1930s and 1940s, they didn't have the political clout to sway the State Department to save many refugees. By the time the Soviet Union dissolved, American Jews had a formidable voice in the country centering their activism around human rights, a new buzzword, of Soviet Jews was instrumental. Here's a little bit of a taste of what was going on at that time. The tension between the grassroots and the establishment that characterized the movement in the West for most of the 1960s was largely neutralized by the mid-1970s. To be sure, there were still differences in tone and strategy, but in many ways a convergence had taken place. In the wake of the Jackson-Vanik Amendment fight, which was a uh, amendment on congressional floor about uh, tying uh, human rights in the Soviet Union to trade agreements, the grassroots had become more organized and the establishment was now freely borrowing from its toolbox. In addition to shifting their focus to lobbying efforts in Washington, the organizations that made up the National Conference on Soviet Jewry were more willing to hit the streets. Malcolm Hohenlein, the former student struggle member and now head of the New York body coordinating all establishment Soviet Jewry activities in the city, organized demonstrations every spring that were basically larger versions of the Yaakov Birnbaum's 1960s rallies. Starting in 1971, an annual Solidarity Sunday drew anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 people in parade demonstrations that ended in Dog Hemarskdrold Plaza outside the UN after a procession down Fifth Avenue. At the 1975 event, 353 chartered buses brought marchers from all over the tri-state area, with the single largest delegation a caravan of nine buses from suburban Merrick, Long Island. Local politicians and presidential candidates showed up yearly to pay their respects. The scenes of massive singing, crowds waving homemade signs, and blown up photos of the prisoners of Zion were covered widely in the press, a regular reminder of Soviet Jewry's centrality for American Jews. At that 1975 rally, a gigantic banner hung over the crowd, their fight is our fight. Still, there was a little bit of hesitation about poking the lion that was the USSR, particularly when American presidents were striving for de-escalation of international tensions. But in later years, due to Carter and Reagan's policies, it was more politically feasible to criticize the Soviet Union, also because the Soviet tactics of spying, suppression, and hard prison sentences conferred behind closed-door courtroom cases for teaching Hebrew or lobbying to emigrate, sometimes backfired. Western journalists were actually able to make contacts among the refuseniks and others, smuggling their words and experiences out of the country and making them the human faces of the movement, the prisoners of Zion. Israel needed American Jews to take the reign because for a while they had no diplomatic contact with the USSR and were a fledgling uh, country themselves, not a superpower. Of course, they wanted these refugees in part to increase the Jewish population of their country, but it was also an ideological step to give these Jews a proud and protected identity. 
the result wasn't some utopia. There are always ups and downs in assimilating a large group of people. But the one million Soviet Jews who found the freedom to live as Jews in Israel certainly helped to change the face and the character of worldwide Jewry as we moved into the 21st century. Beckerman only gives a brief afterwards mention to the 1990s onward. But if you want a comprehensive look at the Soviet Jewry movement during the USSR's heyday and the start of their decline, then this book is a must for your shelves. Well, that about covers it for me. Woo! feel like I crossed the finish line there. One more thing off of my to-do list. In the meantime, I hope uh, that uh, all of my fellow Americans had a happy Independence Day and that uh, everybody everywhere had a happy 4th of July and start of July overall. <laughs> And you can find links to um, the book reviews for these three books and other pertinent information down below. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.